Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We are really looking forward for this webinar. Uh, we'll be waiting for other participants to join in as well before we begin. But as you can all see, it's something very exciting to talk about. Uh, this came very highly requested from all our IEEE participants. So we're really looking forward to interact with you. So thank you so much. Welcome, everyone. And I think we are living in such times that I think the first greeting is going to be, I hope everybody is doing well and keeping safe. And uh, this should be a nice little session for you where it's a very key topic, very important. And it's amazing that all of you can join us. So yes, as Abhishek said, uh, we'll just wait another one minute for everybody to join in and then we'll start right away. And of course, we'd love to hear, listen, uh, answer your questions and queries. We'll, we'll leave some time for that. Uh, we really look forward to interacting with you and wait for that. So keep sending in your questions and comments in the chat box. We are looking at those. Make sure you're sending it to both panelists and attendees. So both Raghav and I and everybody here can see it as well. If you have points to share, some questions to ask, make sure that everybody can see those as well because we want them to learn and take away from those points you're sharing as well. Perfect, that's brilliant then. We'll just wait for another minute because we want all our participants to join in and As PD sir calls it, the Sensex. Sensex going up, yes. We're just Absolutely. waiting for it to rise a little more. <laughs> it's going up somewhere, at least. <laughs> yes. Yes, Ms. Soma, we're with you. Very worried about student education. I mean, every single day we speak to students, and the first thing I tell them is, I'm so sorry that you have to go through this this year. We cannot imagine being in their shoes, especially the ones who were in the board class this year. Very difficult time for them. Absolutely. And I think Abhishek and I can speak from first-hand experience. We both have younger siblings and we're both yeah. facing different kinds of problems uh, with the education front. Absolutely. I mean, we are privileged uh, enough that we are through with that education phase, but I think the, the good thing is that we're here to help the others at least. Uh, sorry, you were saying Abhishek, I'm sorry I interrupted I you. I was just saying, I read, no, no, I just read a comment, our voice is very feeble. Can people confirm that you can hear us loud and clear? because we want you to, we want to be audible and visible. Perfect, great, thank you so much. In case you face a technical difficulty, it's very simple, just reload the page. I mean, this technology gets better for all of us. So perfect. I think on that note, Raga, we can begin without further ado. Participants will keep joining in. Absolutely. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining in again. Um, so like we just talked about international education. Now, international education has always, um, always been a point of discussion in India because in the last 10 to 15 years, if you can say that, the idea of studying abroad has been popularized. Uh, people look at it as something really fancy, but it's grown in especially uh, importance because the kind of opportunities being offered abroad and some of the best schools in the world when we're looking at are just, we cannot just put them to words and cannot even compare and draw a comparison to Indian universities. Even though in the last five, seven years, later half of the last decade, Indian universities, the new age schools have spent enough money, uh, effort, investment, got the right kind of faculty involved in the universities to take it forward. But still the dilemma lies that when should we go and study abroad? But last year when the pandemic started, a whole different can of worms opened up that what should we do about studying abroad? Because certainly we cannot fly to the universities. Does it still make sense to invest so much time, effort and money in going to universities abroad? We really hope, we were really hopeful things will get better this year. They started to look good, but now we know where we are today. But that doesn't mean education has stopped. It never does. So a number of forecasts have been estimated, analyzed by a number of resources. We have done our particular research as well, and we'll be more than happy to share our insights. So that's the topic about. So without further ado, I want to delve deeper into the points we have for you to cover. Now, these are just setting context, some of the major important points of conversation. You can share your questions. Raghav and I will be more than happy to answer to the best of our abilities. Uh, great. So first and important thing, when we speak of studying abroad, there was a number of studies done in the last 12, 13 months. And on average, all of them came up with the figure 60%, as you see on the screens, students who have chosen to defer because they prefer in-person learning. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the deferral system, it basically means students got into the universities, got their offers, but they decided to hold on the program for one year. They pushed the program for another year. Now, this goes both for undergrad and postgrad level students. What they decided to do was, why should we pay so much money? Because universities haven't reduced the fees. 
again, I understand their perspective as well because they are also losing out on funds and very difficult to offer scholarships this year, which we'll cover shortly. The idea is how students should be able to decide that is this the right year to go abroad or not? And that's something which has been very evident in the studies that have been done by a number of international universities, international governing bodies, education systems, and the governments as well. And this is the number. Students still prefer in-person learning. I mean, Raghav and I, more than anything, love talking to people in person, but that's something we cannot do. But do we stop because of it? We cannot do that. But for a student to grasp those concepts, it's very important. And that's exactly that we have observed. Raghav, what do you think about it? So absolutely, Abhishek, completely with you. So, you know, uh, normally what we would do is we would look at that 60% and be like, okay, <clears throat> most students are deferring. Now, I really want you to understand that there is a big chunk. There's the other half of the pie. Well, not half of it, but at least the 40% of it. Why have they chosen not to defer? What are they doing? Their mindset is very different. What they are choosing to do is, let us say, because the SAT requirement and the, you know, all the entrance requirements, those were standard benchmarks since they were waived. It was relatively easier. I'm not saying it's easy still. It was relatively easier to get into, let's say, you know, uh, a Princeton or a UCLA or a Caltech for that matter, right? Because the basic benchmark was removed. Now, once these students are there, what's happening now? It's a four-year program. It's a long journey. As I say, it's a marathon, not a sprint, right? So they would rather spend that one semester, two semesters online, doesn't matter. But at the end of the day, the three years they will get to spend in America at that prestigious college in person learning. If you know about the American education system or the UK education system, or just generally the first year when you are a freshman, it typically like covers very basic, you know, introduction foundational stuff. You can afford to spend it online. The 40% of these students have actually chosen to do that because the end goal, that is that university degree matters more, right? That is what the other 40% are thinking. These 60%, yes, they absolutely prefer in-person learning, but we cannot cannot discount the fact that they have not taken the SAT, they have not taken the GMAT for the postgraduate program and so on. The universities have not made it clear that you have deferred it, yes. Next year, when they have an equivalent candidate who has actually taken the SAT, what happens then? Do they, so, do they say no to that person? Or do they not give the person who has deferred a seat? Right. So that is something that is not clear right now. And that is a dilemma that is going to come back and haunt us. Uh, the second point you see on your screen, an upward trend. This is no surprise, right? We have seen such a dip. This is a simple case of there's only, you know, you can only hit rock bottom that way. There's only going up from here, right? So whether it's in September this year, we've already seen a spike. People are willing, students are willing to go to the foreign countries for the education. Yes. And even 22, I think we should expect a bigger boom. Uh, again, very obvious reasons. I'm not saying the pandemic is over. I mean, currently, I don't even need to state the facts. India is not in a great place, right? So there are multiple reasons people are looking to go abroad. They're just looking to get out of the country in some way, right? Things are not working very well. They've got their own reasons. The families are willing to spend uh, the money, send their kids ab uh, abroad where they're safer, right? Similarly, better education, good opportunity. So definitely the dip that we have seen in 2020, not going to follow in 21 or 22. This is something we have experienced first time. We work with students all the time. It's a wonderful golden opportunity and they're going to grab it with open hands once again. Uh, what do you think, Abhishek? No, absolutely, Raghav. Just to build on that, in fact, I'll quickly, after I share my perspective on this, I'll answer two questions we have from Ms. Minu and Ms. Sood. The idea here is because students have been deprived of that opportunity this year, does not mean they'll stop, st stop studying. And to, let's be very honest here. If I'm looking at the top schools in India and looking at the best universities in the world, it's apples and oranges. I can't compare. It's very unfair on Indian universities to be compared to the best schools in the world, who which have existed for hundreds of years, if not more. And the idea is the establishment and the kind of reputation they come with globally cannot be matched. So even if, and this is what I'm uh, also answering your question, Ms. Minu. So listen intently. The idea is when we are looking at universities, which have said we'll continue classes online, but understand, right? If you're looking at a University of California or Harvard or Oxford or Cambridge, if I'm getting into these universities, I don't mind getting online education because it's still the same professors. It's a different thing altogether that right now I'm ascertaining that they'll continue classes online depending on the current situation. Nobody's stopping the universities from opening up if things get better. For example, just as of last week, UK reported no new cases in COVID-19 in the last 14 months. And just because of the vaccination drive is being happening really well. Some countries in Europe have done that, but some countries in Europe have shut down again. The idea is, 
I mean, if I were to study in New Zealand, Australia, they have a complete bubble, no more cases, but they won't allow international students in at least for good six to seven months. But if it gets better, they will let them in. So we cannot be too sure about the statements coming out and that have been declared because things are changing every other day. We cannot be too sure about anything. That being said, it's very important for us to understand that we encourage as educators, students to take the right courses and build the right skills. That is still going to be important. And why Raghav is talking about an upward trend is because even if I'm starting my graduation today, I'll still look for a job opportunity three or four years down the line. That, that won't change. I cannot go and see the pandemic happened and I have no other option. I did not decide to study that particular year. I kept, kept pushing my degree for two, three years. That's not how it is. You still need to be educated. And the idea is if in India, my education is happening online and if by paying slightly higher amount, especially for people who can afford to, I'd rather get a degree from the best universities in the world. And the best scenario is if I'm looking at countries like Canada, they will let students in next year at least, if not end of this year. Students have been notified. If things get better, you, we will allow you to come in later half of 2021 or early 22. I would rather go there like Raghav was mentioning about. At least my parents will be like, my kids are safer there. Why wouldn't I do that? I do see a lot of questions coming in as well. And I want to just take this one. Absolutely, Ms. Uma, so many people are not allowing people from India. This is for now. Not only India, they're not letting people in from a lot of countries for that matter. But students are still, I want to give you a quick fact. Just let us let me just talk about Harvard this year. Even the pandemic, the applications increased by 17% and the acceptance rate still went down by three point, like literally a 0.5% if I'm correct. The idea is people still kept applying to the universities. I'm literally giving you facts here. That basically meant students did not show any decline in terms of their interest to study abroad. This brings me to my next point, especially because a lot of people who are in the workforce, young graduates, who are young professionals, this, is, this year has been very difficult for them. Some of them have lost jobs. Some of them are not able to get the promotions. So what are they doing? They're going back to school because now they can afford to. Some of them are wondering, going doing an MBA in one or two years, doing a master's in another year. But now they have been like, oh, why not do it this year? Because even if, even if it's happening online, some countries are offering postgrad programs completely the way they were because they're safer. They let you come in and do the program. So the year the world had stopped for others, they went back to school and got the degree which they would have to wait for and take a break from work down the line. So this trend is going to continue. We have already observed this trend rising in the last two to three months. I'm speaking from our experience at Mindler, but industry trend is very similar. This is bound to increase. I'll give you a few facts here and then I'll pass it on to Raga for his insights. The fact is because the different kind of careers that are coming up now, universities are collaborating with industry professionals and developing programs which are required for the future. For example, if you were to ask me, Abhishek, tell me how many programs in epidemiology exist in the world today, I could have barely named 10. I can tell you 50 today because they exist. Universities have recognized the importance of growing careers, data science as a career, fintech as an industry. I can go on and on about it. It's a whole different webinar altogether. The idea is how universities are accommodating and how people are responding. So this is something I have seen to grow in postgraduate applications. At least, Raghav, what's your take on this? Yeah. So while those points are absolutely true, and I'll just get to a couple of questions in the chat as well. Why are we expecting to see an upsurge in the PG programs? Why masters? Now let's look at a student who finished his bachelor's in 2019, had absolutely no clue that the pandemic is coming to us, came, and we all know what happened in 2020, right? In my view, I was somebody who has finished his bachelor's, was looking to work for a couple of years and then start my master's. But my work scenario has not improved at all because we all saw people lost jobs, uh, the employment rates were low. So the person has actually not done much during that year, year and a half now, right? But now they plan to pursue that postgraduate degree. So that makes them more employable in most countries. If I'm looking at Canada, which is a very clear case where a postgraduate degree, a master's degree or a diploma is more valued, right? In any case, in any point in terms, right? So over there, these are the people who will be willing to kind of prepone their plans. If they were going to do it next year, they're going to pursue it this year. That's why it's this chunk of people that I'm looking at that you're going to see an upsurge in the postgraduate program specifically, right? Most people take a break, but the pandemic has already compelled them to take a break now. So they're going to go and apply for that master's program right away because they've already lost a couple of precious years in their life, right? They've not done much in terms of uh, work experience and so on. So that's why we're going to see that jump right away. Uh, in the chat, I'll just take a couple of questions. So one was, how about the possibility of getting in a transfer student after studying first year in India? So Ms. Renuka, this is something I would say 
that does not normally happen you cannot unless the university has an exclusive tie up and arrangement set up with the university like for example in india manipal university does this they have a couple of tie ups with the american universities or australian universities where you do two years in india you spend the two years in the other country and you eventually get up getting your bachelor's degree from that university unless your university has this sort of an arrangement you being an international student will already put you on a back foot where you cannot take a transfer and expect those first year credits to be transferred to that university not going to happen right one because the curriculum is different the the structure is completely different so there is no course equivalent there so that's a very very un, unless a child is a prodigy and the university is absolutely dying to take them in which is a very different case otherwise it's not uh, it's not a possible option uh some students are in doubt that how will they be perceived with the most of the year being offline well that's the case uh, miss meenu then it's not going to be completely offline that's what abhishek said uh it's a four year program the end goal is happening down four years a line right if you are sitting in 21 somebody starting their bachelor's today is only going to graduate in 25 long time away so it's uh, i understand where the skepticism is coming from uh, but it's something that is very temporary that's just a bubble for that talking about the next point the rise in competition now we all know for a fact that america has been the most sought after the most popular destination if i was to go to a tier 2 city in india or a tier 3 city in india and ask them that yes i'm studying abroad and just tell somebody their first assumption is going to be they're studying in america that's just what studying abroad means for most people and no denying that some of the best colleges in the world are in america but now with the pandemic hitting and the structure everything going online everybody has had a very i would say realistic uh, approach to understand okay why america why can i not do it in canada i'm saving money there why can i not do it in the uk why can i not do it in the europe right the singapore this australia so now us is having to fight to keep that dominant position live in the market they are not they're still leaders but they're not dominant leaders they were let's say 5 years 6 years ago the other countries have caught up the universities had caught up they've got amazing faculty recognition awards uh, collaborations for that matter if i look at the nobel uh, uh, prize winners not all of them have come from america surprisingly in the past years they've all come from europe they've come from canada they've come from australia uh so america has lost that i would say they've not lost all the charm but that little bit of a shine has gone the multiple factors adding to it not just the competition uh we there are political policies as well which we'll talk about later but there are multiple factors into play here so yes the us will have to compete this is something we are forecasting as well the competition is going to be tough but it's good for the students on the other hand because they have so much more to choose from and there are more credible choices there uh what do you abhishek uh, your perspective on this absolutely and i saw some very good question i'll come to that later but just to add to this i think raga want to talk about rising competition because when you're looking at the us in particular the major thing is not just competition from students the idea is funding is a major, major issue in the pandemic the i mean funding and financial aid for parents have been hurt as well and people who are trying to self fund their programs the loans uh, being received by students have been reduced as well that means it's very difficult for them to study in the us because it's one of the most cost- costliest place for especially undergraduate education uh, canada again is competing because of its liberal political policies immigration policies number of reasons and also quality of education which people don't consider they feel canada is a place for public for just getting your permanent residence the idea is different canada is brilliant for some of the courses now speaking of the countries that are competing uh, australia was always popular uk was always popular uk has become popular again in the last two years because of resurgence of the two year stay back visa but other than that some of the new countries i don't i won't say new they've always been there with good universities but they come to like like netherlands became very popular with the kind of programs they have there some of the leading universities in the world people don't know about ireland has become very popular in the last 2 3 years we can look at so many different countries in that regard singapore has become popular all over again because it's safer country that way in terms of the political climate in terms of the regulation that are available for graduates the kind of opportunities they get coming from the top schools in singapore so people are rethinking the kind of options they have also it's closer to home so people are wondering that god forbid something happens we need to be accessible to people so they're looking at these options as well another important factor to consider is research opportunities now we living in a world where research is the most sought after world i mean thanks to all the organization that came together research and got the vaccines in place people are looking to get into research careers because they will be highly paid paid professions down the line they are still are in some of the countries i mean countries like india recognizing the importance that also means us has already extinguished or so many 
because us has been literally the front runner in research people are rethinking what about the domains that are unexplored untapped in different countries switzerland germany they want to be very popular they are home to some of the best tech schools in the world some of the best med schools in the world so the idea is people are rethinking in terms of different countries to explore that will i mean continue to reduce the shine in the us and but that being said what rago said earlier i cannot compete with the ivy league colleges they are still the best in the world i am not taking anything away from mit caltech georgia tech these are a carnegie mellon for that matter these are the best tech and computer schools in the world but of course it's about rethinking the point i want to take a couple of questions before i move forward uh there was a question about post grad which was about mim or mba quickly uh okay should we graduate off for mim course in europe instead of mba okay because work experience is a deciding factor here mba is very different in india than it's abroad very few schools in india like isb the best mba business school in the world literally one of the best in india for sure they definitely looking at some work experience if you are a fresh graduate i think doing an mim makes more sense rather when i both have specialized masters we can tell you it gives you the same exposure but once you walk in with experience mba becomes more viable so if you are somebody who is in the work experience bracket of 0 to 2 years or 0 to 3 years mim is preferable but you can reach out to us we'll help you out with that phd aspirants as well like i mentioned the importance of research research is growing rapidly so phd scholars and aspirants are reaching out to universities uh, more rigorously uh, on a regular basis asking for opportunities some of the universities have started posting out opportunities on linkedin as well because they need those candidates to do research so we can discuss that in length moving out to the next point higher discounts so some universities when you look at tuition fee that's the major consideration some countries are so big on those that students just get scared they don't want to apply anymore they feel we can't afford that fees and scholarships are less but universities have resorted to some form of discounts or relief in terms of tuition fees they are giving higher discounts to attract more international students because it's difficult for them them to afford the entire cost if they don't get scholarships but if universities tend to reduce the cost in some way or the other it can be any benefits they can provide not just in tuition living costs it can be additional benefits they can provide and there's so many of them even if you open a fees and financing page of any international university you'll be surprised to see what parameters are there what are the kind of costs associated if universities can provide some relief to the students that would be a major major advantage for them to reconsider the decision or they might just be attracted enough because of that particular relief so these higher discounts being offered are going to be a huge huge point of importance what do you think rago absolutely and i think when we look when we hear the word discounts and in no way i'm downplaying anything but in india we typically think of it as a bargain that we are getting from them this is not a shock they are running we are not going like okay it's a 30000 degree uh, 30000 dollar program give it to me for 20 it does not work like that what they are willing to do for you is discount yes if you just put write them an email and mention to them that yes uh, this is a a big big figure for me cannot really meet that expectation the universities will oblige and uh, we personally have had students who have actually reached out the thing is if you do not reach out you will never know right there's no harm in sending that email to the admission office they might get back to you with a positive response in other terms the scholarships are going up because the year that they've spent having classes online they have saved so much money of that research being done on campus being classes held on campus everything so they have i would say they don't have an upsurge of funds but they have previous funds that are pending with them most of the big universities and trust me when we talk about research institutes in the world they receive huge hundreds of millions of dollars in funding that is still available to them and they'll be more than happy to offer scholarships right they have to mobilize those funds in some way so scholarships yes that is what we mean when we talk about discounts financial aid yes they'll be more than happy to uh, offer you that so that's what we mean by high discounts the next point that you see is the gen z wave right who are these gen z people right gen z people are the people who are applying to for the undergrads now it could be you know people who are born after i think correct me if i'm wrong i'm getting 97 98 people 97, born after that 97. yeah so 97 right so relatively young people now the difference here is that their mindset uh, the culture they're growing up in the friends they have what matters to them what appeals to them everything is different the shine and the charm of a foreign education it doesn't have to be america again as she already mentioned the just the charm of the foreign education of uh, they are not only going there to study they're going there to absorb that culture they're going there to absorb that experience academics is only a part of it earlier if in it was 95 1990s when i went to a stanford or a harvard 
I was only going there to study, possibly get a job. But today, when a student goes to America or Canada or Australia, they're not only going there to study, they're going to learn so much more. These are intangible values that, you know, students gain while they're in that country. For example, I was able to gain a completely different set of values when I went to America. I had grown up thinking that, yes, America exists this way because that's what the TV movies and the show has shown us. But the reality is very different. It's these things that the kids get to learn firsthand, experience firsthand. How is the culture? How? Because everybody has got value to add, right? Of course, there's so much they can learn from outside the university as well. So that is so important. And that's why we see the Gen Z mindset. These are the people who are going to be driving that upward trend that we were talking about. So yes, uh, Abhishek, your thoughts on this? No, absolutely, Raghav. That's the idea because I think this generation knows how to question. They start with why. That's something I really like about the generation because to be very honest, for somebody who's listening to them, they might get annoyed, but I absolutely respect the generation because they always have questions and that's the kind of mindset universities are looking for. When we speak of the Gen Z wave, it also goes parallelly to what, what universities are expecting now from the future generation. They understand that these people are going to be the leaders of tomorrow, people who are getting into university now. The kind of skill set they come in with already is amazing. I mean, you have been the part of the EDUCA conference, Raghav. You've heard so many speakers there and you know what I'm talking about. When we speak of education technology, technology is a major part here. These people coming in, they know so much by the time they're in college. I mean, we've heard of people in the last one week who are 10, 11 years old and can code applications. I mean, I was literally embarrassed. I still cannot do that. But the idea is these are the important skills of the future. If you're not doing it, you're catching up. The students are working up with the mindset that we have a whole different parameter in front of us. We are looking at a whole different skill set that we need. We're looking at very different programs. Now, just imagine the time they were growing up five years ago, the kind of courses that exist in universities today were not even heard of. They were looking at careers that were redundant, don't are not prevalent anymore, are not required anymore. By the time they graduate, the kind of industries they'll be looking at is very different. I mean, the pandemic gave, gave rise to so many industries. For those of you who believe the pandemic shut down more industries, trust me, you're definitely incorrect there. I'm being very honest. The more industries that have thrived in the pandemic than the ones that have collapsed. Simply because people saw opportunities where others saw challenges. And they came up with the best alternatives. And this generation in particular is contributing to that. These are the young brains who are going to go ahead and make a difference. And that's exactly what we mean by the Gen Z wave. These are smarter kids anything, any day of the week. They know more than us, especially the millennials. They're faster, more agile. And that's exactly the point when you look at Gen Z. Just one thing, I wanted, to, just please, one thing please. I wanted to add, Abhishek. I think Gen Z, one key word that Abhishek also pointed out, and I think one thing that's key to remember is these are the future problem solvers for us. Yes. Uh, one thing that we hear so often like from my parents, big generation gap, what we hear from them, and this is something that's standard that we've handed over a world to you that is not in the best of, I would say, states in, a, in the best of situation, right? There's so many world problems. It's the Gen Z. We are handing over a world to them, yes, but they are much better problem solvers than we are, right? So I think that's why we're talking about the Gen Z wave. So that's really important. Perfect, Raghav. I just want to add, quickly mention, I'm so sorry, we won't be able to answer all these questions you are talking about in terms of universities in particular. I would request you to write to us. If you put down our emails, we'll be more than happy to connect with you because that'd be easier for us. But about the topics you're talking about, uh, PhD, Ms. Lalita, very quickly, most of the PhDs at leading schools in the world are fully funded programs. Not only 100% scholarship, I mean fully funded. You don't have to pay anything. You get paid to study those programs. So you want more information, you can reach out to us. Now, coming back to this particular... Okay. Also about the non-English speaking countries, let me tell you one thing very quickly. Countries like Netherlands, France, Germany, Switzerland, Italy, they do have a number of English speaking courses. Now, please understand, it also depends on the domains I'm looking at doing. Some domains will require you to have particular proficiency in the language, a certain level. Some of them won't because courses will be offered in English as well, but it's about doing a deep study about it. You can reach out to us. We'll be more than happy to help you in that regard. But number of students go abroad and study. Okay, I want to, okay, Raghav has answered that. Perfect, perfect, great. So moving on to the next point, fostering collaboration. I think the only way to move forward is by collaborating. When we mean collaboration, I'm talking about collaboration between education institutions and corporations, education and ed tech organizations, education and partners who are coming together to provide the right set of skills to students. Now, the idea here is that we have witnessed that 
universities are not able to function the way they were. They collaborated with organizations like Coursera, EDX, to provide online learning programs, develop new modules. They've collaborated with edtech platforms who are operating on AI platform, machine learning platforms, to bring in that experience. I mean, digital storytelling was just a thing that was heard of two years ago, wasn't practiced. Now we have platforms like Digital Teller, uh, Storyboard, brilliant platforms to explore for students. They're bringing that experience into reality. And why is this important? Because back in the day, we learned from apprenticeship. This is a very outdated word now, except accountancy. But this is what we're doing exactly, bringing in that experience into online virtual classrooms. I mean, if I cannot go to school, cannot go to university, I'm bringing the experience to me because I can sit at one place at home and get educated by any university in the world. That is the charm of it. I know it has a set of challenges, but if I can only see the silver lining for once, I'll realize how important and beneficial it will be in the long run. Never ever could you have imagined that we'll be sitting in a room in India and be educated from Harvard, educated professors around the world. You can take up programs and internships from organizations like Google, literally based out of their US offices. And this is possible now, today. You can volunteer with major organizations like the UN sitting in India. And this is very, very important for you to understand. But the idea is the only way to survive is through collaboration. I don't think it's an option even now, Raghav. What do you think? Absolutely. So when we talk about collaboration, so I'll tell you, this is something they have been doing in the past as well when I was in the US. And this has only increased over time. And I think the pandemic has been a catalyst towards this collaboration because it became easier. So what used to happen is uh, Google used to approach universities, offer these competitions, right? And the idea behind this is, of course, you get a certificate and everything that you participated in one. But the idea is that you're solving a simple problem. There is benefit for both, right? The students get to work in a team, get to solve a problem for Google. Google gets a very good solution. And that way brings credibility to both of them, right? To, uh, the Google product and the university. That's one way that they can collaborate. The other option is uh, the universities in California or the West Coast for that matter, or the East Coast. They will get guests from the Silicon Valley. They'll get from absolutely the top headquarters. Get them for a guest lecture. They don't have to travel. They could be very well doing it from their office, right? For example, if I had to call somebody like a PD sir, for example, right, from Mindler, PD sir doesn't need to travel to a place today. Similarly, if it's a CEO, CEO, CXO of a big, big corporate, they don't need to travel anywhere. They can be in two places at one time, right? It has made collaboration so much easier it has promoted it to a level which had not been anticipated earlier. And this has worked wonders, right? Recruitment has become easier. Uh, the research faculty has improved, funding has improved because the exposure they're getting. So this is something that is key. So yes, the universities will be looking to foster. That's the key word that they'll be looking to foster those collaborations, increase that because that's the big, big value add for 2021 and 2022 moving forward. The learning management systems. So just to make it very clear, uh, of course, we call them the LMS. The LMS are basically anything that most of your students or your children will be using today, right? If they're studying online, their schools would have already implemented this. So this is, could be something like a Blackboard or a Moodle, right? These are all learning management systems that all universities are implementing. Now, how has a change come into this earlier? These were primarily meant for your homework assignments, uh, maybe assigning your home, uh, uh, you know, readings, documents, and so on and so forth. Now they've actually decided to include the video conference. They've decided to include a virtual whiteboard, right? There's so much more that can be happened that can be done now. For example, I get it. The teacher does not have a whiteboard to write on, but they could very well have an iPad, which the university is happy to provide them or any tablet and just write on the tablet. It is as good as writing on the whiteboard and the students get to see it on their virtual, on their laptops, on their tablets anyway. So that is something the learning management systems have brought in and it has become so easy to deliver content, to deliver information to students now. Again, boundaries are not a barrier anymore. So this works out wonderfully. Even when the boundaries and the restrictions are lifted and I'm really hoping that happens soon, the pandemic is done away with, it's a thing of the past. The innovation that has happened in these learning management systems is gonna stay, right? The things that have improved are always going to stay. And I think that's acted as such a big catalyst for us. What do you think Abhishek? No, I think Raghav, that's the thing. No, that's the interesting thing about the pandemic. I mean, the opportunities we come up with, they're going to retain for the future. I mean, we are looking at the normal. There's no new normal anymore. This is how we're going to live. 
for the rest of it. In terms of technology, the way it's coming to, I'm just blending in the two points that you can see on the, on the screens. LMS 10 years ago was just something that organizations used to use to pass on information around the organ, the companies. But now, like Raghav spoke of Moodle, I'm very familiar to Moodle. That's what we were using. I think Moodle is outdated now because schools and universities have come with better platforms, more handy, more convenient. And that's exactly the point because they can pass on information easily. There's no time being lost. There's no lag at all. I mean, back in the day, teachers used to send homework through emails if they had to send or just give it over to students next day in classrooms. But literally with a click of a button, they're getting every possible download they can imagine. And that's the advantage. It's only going to continue. The gift of technology, I think it's that gift that keeps giving because we have only improved our classrooms. They are more creative classrooms in terms of how they have grown. We are encouraging students to do you think think out of the box or just remove the box altogether. I think Raghav, when you were speaking about the fact that how can we, about PDSA for that matter, just for your reference last week, there's a particular platform that we were speaking on. It's again, an audio platform called Clubhouse and we got to speak to the new director of International Baccalaureate. I mean, he's a finance and education minister of Finland at this point of time. And I served the office. I could have never in my life imagined even reaching out to him. But this is the beauty of such virtual technology platforms. They're connecting the world and how. Technology is going to continue to grow. Imagine students in the classroom getting to try out platforms like, I mean, Byte Junior for that matter. I'm a big fan of the platform. They're encouraging coding from class six onwards. I mean, there's so many alternate platforms in the States and in the UK that are offering for students, uh, this program to students even younger. We know this lady in the UK in particular who's bringing up an AI-based platform. She's a tech consultant who's creating a virtual environment for students. They can sit at home and learn from different classrooms, different experiences they can think about. And this is the power of imagination blended with technology and research. And technology is only growing creativity. There's so many possible questions to be answered, but never ever in our lives we ever bother to think about them. The more we think, the more questions we have, the more curiosity we'll have. But technology is answering most of them. It's very important to understand that this, I know a lot of you will have questions that technology might not work out the way it is. It might have its disadvantages. I agree with you. But we have to speak of moderation. And very important thing, your role as educator, as an educator comes into the picture because you have to foster that, okay, this is the kind of mindset we have to inculcate in students. We cannot force this. We have to help them practice and get it. Because end of the day, the new wave, this is the future. But we cannot just push somebody to move to the new normal. That's not how it works. And technology is just making it convenient for us. Okay, there are a lot of questions we'll come to. I think, Raghav, let's just cover the last yeah. few points we have. Yeah, and I then just wanted, we to, can add, I just wanted to add on the technology bit quickly. Uh, there's this story uh, that we had come across just, I think, last week, Abhishek, you were telling me. So typically, what most universities are looking for, and this is something we have seen with our students as well. One typical question is, what did you do, what did you do in the lockdown? How were you productive? Right, And this is the same question that's going to carry forward to 21 as well and moving forward to 22. Technology is a major player in that. If you have not used technology to be productive in that entire year, year and a half, in any way whatsoever, that leaves a gap in your application now, which was not the case earlier. So when we say that it's a gift of technology, one that keeps giving, I'll just give you a very brief example. So we were talking to these, uh, this girl who was part of this school, I think from Pune, if I'm not mistaken, Abhishek, right? So basically what they did during the pandemic was they used the technology. They were amazing at sports, right? But decided to kind of come together as a team, started making these little videos of, let's say, just how to dribble a football, how to dribble a hockey ball, right? Or how do we do certain tricks? Record the little snippets and share it, started sharing it with their school students, their juniors and so on, right? The school loved it so much, the kind of attraction they got that they actually decided to implement this entire thing into their LMS. It became accessible to everybody and it became a full-fledged program, right? That these girls were able to lead. Now, this became such a powerful example of the use of technology and being productive and volunteering, community service, helping others, checked all the boxes just with the simple use of technology and one idea. So I think when we say that it is the gift, it is an absolute gift. So yeah, we cannot emphasize enough the importance it brings in. Right, so the next point the health is at the center stage. I don't think this is something we really need to be highlighting, but now when we talk about factors, when it comes to studying abroad, there used to be what location are you studying? What is the fee structure like? What is the location like? What is the weather like? So on and so forth, faculty, collaboration and everything. Today, another factor that has been added is what do the health protocols look like? 
how safe will be my student there right if i am a student how safe will i be there how what do what does my health insurance cover how good is the medical facility will i be able to get good service all the time what what happens if i get in an accident what happens if i get sick right these are questions that nobody really thought about earlier we just paid that health insurance fee and trust me all universities ask for it we normally just pay it blindly never really considering that yes what is it for but today every parent wants to find out this $1000 or $2000 that i'm paying towards my child's health insurance where is that going and what is my child going to get in return so health is at the center stage this is something that is undeniable and i really don't think there is any way around it this is going to be at the center stage moving forward as long as we know that such viruses such things exist uh, what do you think abhishek uh, anything no, else why is it so important i think i don't think i can add anything to that raga because health is something important the world came to halt i mean we've seen it i mean universities are looking at student passports where uh, i mean literally the vaccine passports for students now implementing those because they want to understand if they've been vaccinated or not and what kind of health issues are they suffering with same with students and parents as well they more concerned than ever that what are the kind of facilities being offered just for your point of reference even in india some of the universities ended up making the new buildings altogether just to make sure there are enough social distancing measures for students moving forward i mean there's so much infrastructure investment being happening for this moving on to the next point internships will become popular just making it clear they've always been popular but the kind of internships that people are looking at have just grown in such a major way i'm looking at people coming for digital marketing research areas people looking for sustainability interns who are looking at new and better measures to come up with better policies better resources better problem solving ability to solve the problems of tomorrow end of the day but internships have taken i think students even in class 9 10 11 are looking at internships now back in the day it was only college students or maybe class 12 students all of you know about the minor scholarship fund we had 15000 student interns working with us class 12 kids but i have come across so many students who are in class 9 10 in turning and you might wonder that why and what are they learning they're literally learning on the job skills but the major advantage is you can sit in india work with any organization in the world it doesn't matter who you are it's your skill set your will to learn that's important and people are looking for these interns and it's only going to grow in popularity universities are collaborating with organizations putting them into universe into the corporate side of it right away colleges are seeing that students coming to our university should be able to train in these particular skill set and they're collaborating with the right organizations right associations who are promoting and building these skills that are going to be required in the business world in the corporate world entrepreneurship is spoken of you know one of the most interesting things for students what entrepreneurship really means they're putting them through those virtual internship programs or career simulator programs career incubators for that matter these are all growing in popularity just want to add to that not only internships summer programs somebody asked about they still exist they become virtual i know it's not really fair some of the universities are charging the same price but some of them have done a reduction in cost have changed the program curriculum to make it more friendly towards online education so i think internships will continue to grow because how else do you get experience this is the best possible way and now more than ever you are more time sitting at home to devote to that what do you think raghav absolutely so when we talk about internships getting popular one point uh, i think this is something most of us or you might know somebody who has experienced this whoever lost their job during the pandemic right they lost it and they were not able to get reemployed at xyz company because it was in different domain was primarily because they had no experience i think internships are a beautiful way for you to learn skills that are away and different from your career domain if i was a computer science student and i have interned at let's say a consulting company or you know learned a little bit of management skills that just makes me more employable not just an, as an engineer but even let's say as a manager not initially but at least that skills had added to my val- uh, portfolio is always valuable so when we say they're becoming popular i think it is so important that yes we get those different skills on board and not just stick to the confirmed boundaries that yes you're an engineer all you need to do is problem solve think analytically that's it there's so many other things you can do nobody stopping you and that is what the world is looking for that is what most employers are looking for otherwise you're not being able to come up with solutions that are innovative that are different right uh there was just one question how can i get 100% scholarship uh 100% scholarships to be really honest there's so many other different factors academics and everything so i'm not saying it's impossible but a very very i would say special uh, case there 
moving to the next point somebody did mention uh, you know about diversity in the chat so yes diversity inclusion financial aid key factors that are going to pick up right most universities 2020 again was an eye opener right so many things came into light of how there's been uh, i would say so little diversity in terms of education in most countries in most educational institutions all of a sudden they need to boost this they need to improve on this and the only way they can do this is increase international uh, admissions the incoming students and so on and so forth no matter for what program for what level of program it is they have to have diversity in their institute because the value that diversity brings to them it's not only for them to look good on paper but for you as a student for them it just adds so much value for example if i was going there from india somebody was coming from indonesia somebody was coming from let's say south america what's normal for us what's culture for us is so different and it is a different growing stage altogether for all of us so that is going to be at the center once again right the, the entire term of being inclusive yes it's going to matter a lot and of course when we talk about diversity there are people coming in from all different financial backgrounds right from all different walks of life not every country not every parent will have enough money as the other right so financial aid is absolutely a key component the idea is that if you want to support diversity you want to be inclusive being the key word you have to have to provide them with financial aid because ultimately you're trying to boost that inclusivity so yes when we talk about trends for the upcoming years inclusivity diversity and financial aid is at the right at the top as well uh, abhishek over to you no absolutely raghav this is important i want to speak of inclusivity more because the idea is diversity we can try and encourage but inclusivity is important the kind of mindset we have to create and especially i don't have to remind anybody what the world has gone through in the last 12 months in terms of so many movements happening around the world even now what's happening in some of the countries it's just horrific it's too difficult to speak about as well but universities need to build that culture because again coming back to the thing the kind of people they bring into the campuses will be the kind of people that go and lead the world tomorrow and solve problems so very important factor but it's not going to happen on its own i cannot come up with proposals i can't justify uh universities have to make a strong measure put their foot down because to be very honest universities have always encouraged diversity on campuses but unfortunately that has never been implemented fully i mean to be very honest i think raghav and i come from two of the most diverse universities in the world in that regard and we can tell you how much that how much a difference that makes we are friends around the world uh, working all over the place coming with such diverse and rich exposure and background that's very very important for the university point of view as well um, i think i will come to the question later let's wrap up our points first absolutely yeah okay increase in investment very simple the student experience is more important than ever it's more immersive than it was it's more interactive than it was and i'm speaking both online and offline even if i'm looking at an online model of education for the temporary future or the foreseeable future the idea is how do i invest more into the kind of opportunities they have the activities they have somebody asked how many internships are available how easy it is it's not easy but i have to invest in that invest in skills investing in boosting these opportunities collaborations come at a cost they don't come literally they don't come for free you universities have to make that effort provide the right kind of experiences to students i mean if i'm looking at virtual learning what are the kind of infrastructure i can provide my students with what are the kind of immersive experience i can bring into the picture what are the kind of uh, innovative technology i can bring into the system that students can avail what are the kind of softwares and programs we can invest in just creating a better experience for students that's the mindset got to be and that's what universities are focusing on raghav anything to add on that No I think when we talk about the student experience I think when I chose to go to Minnesota one of the things was that yes they were offering so many things on campus those campuses were full of different clubs societies activities to do I was a growing up I was a national debater uh I wanted to continue with that and Minnesota provided me the perfect platform where I could still be a speaker I wanted to be now uh those campuses uh those clubs societies are shut simply because everything's happening virtually So what are the universities doing? They're giving these clubs, the presidents of these societies, funding, money to to be able to implement it all online, to be able to purchase tools that are needed, to be able to successful, to be able to collaborate together, to be still to be still be able to grow in that particular. For example, we had an art club, right? What they used to do was they used to paint on uh, walls and stuff, basically go around decorating the university. That was the idea behind it. now they cannot do that because they're not in the campus physically so what are they doing they're using softwares online collaborating still making portraits and for most of you if you do not know today those portraits can be sold for millions of dollars from a simple concept which i'm not going to delve into but it's called an nft right artwork 
your moments in time are precious and they're leveraging uh, the entire blockchain technology right so yes the universities are willing to invest a lot in that student experience yes that's absolutely correct abhi fake uh, non fungible token thank you for that so yes they are investing in that they're trying to incorporate new things that the world has seen in the past year so very important rule of immigration policies this is something that we talked about earlier this is going to be a once again a very very key deciding factor uh one example would be when i was in america i saw the change from the obama administration to the trump administration and what happened after that is history it is not even delve into it but things changed for america right other destinations became more attractive people started liking canada more because of the liberal immigration policies australia became a hot destination once again because of the liberal uh, immigration policy when it came for the students at least right now with the policies changing once again with uk opening its doors to so many students with uk providing these two year work to your time period after your post graduate degree to be able to spend time in the uk and work without a sponsorship things like this are added benefits that you cannot look beyond you know these are again once again adding intangible value to it something that you cannot overlook at all so yes rule of immigration policies how stable is the student going to be right how difficult or how easy it is going to be finding a job all of these things matter and once they get a job of course most students are looking to kind of settle in that country or settle in some country for that matter with that educational experience how is that going to help how is that going to come into play what policies have been changed right we uh, i saw a question earlier from somebody that indians are not not being allowed to enter a lot of country today once again it is a very very temporary thing uh, i'm not saying you know there's a very famous saying indians are everywhere that is still going to be the case they are every we are everywhere no matter where you go they're not going to be able to stop anybody right it is a very temporary thing they're doing it for their own safety which is absolutely justifiable i mean we did the same when america was at the peak of the pandemic we said americans are not allowed in the country right mm -hmm. who are we to say no but we did similarly if they're saying no to us they're doing it for safety reasons that's absolutely fine give it a matter of you know a few months that will be done students will be able to travel again fly to america everything will get back to at least some sort some sort of normalcy so yes that's a very temporary thing uh, abhishek your thoughts on immigration i think i agree with you there i have not much to add but i quickly want to say i think this makes a lot of difference for people because now they are when they investing they look want to settle in the countries now canada australia these are easy countries to settle down in but you they have to also remember i always say this and i will continue saying this at least for the possible future because that's how it is you have to understand the kind of skill set you're going to acquire and the courses you're looking at you cannot put a price on that i mean canada is a great country to study but so many courses are not prevalent in canada i found to study design for that matter canada is not big on design not big on those kind of fine arts careers for that matter they have the universities but as a career i have to look at more countries like europe uk and us so you have to understand why you go to a particular country immigration is important reason but number of factors to consider so don't lose sight of that coming to the last point in particular steam not stem i mean arts is an important point moving forward i cannot emphasize on this enough universities are coming up with more liberal curricular programs around the world if they do not have it already i cannot talk about us because they were always liberal but the importance of stem courses was prevalent but the inclusion of arts and the upsurge of programs in arts is so important now because it's just about the interdisciplinarity the liberal curriculum universities often that's what students are attracted to why because we cannot survive with one particular domain i mean we have to navigate our path on average like giving a quick figure i mean we are doing a study and we realize that on average a student only knows a student ends up changing seven to eight careers in their lifetime that's a lot of careers to change just think about it but how am i navigating through these paths i mean i always want to be engineer but doesn't mean that's the last career i'll be a part of throughout my professional career so arts is growing in importance cannot put a price on it because we have observed how the world has evolved we have to be giving the due importance to every possible subject domain and with all due respect that's very important raghav your thoughts on that absolutely so i think steam this is something we've seen this upward trend in india also the pace at which the liberal arts universities have grown is only proof enough that yes it's no longer just stem but steam that we're looking at i think that very rightly puts it so simply uh, engineering arts and mathematics towards the end so yes i think when i went when you go to america when you go to canada there's a very clear segregation right if you, for example if i'm looking to study my computer science if i'm looking to study chemistry i can either choose to do a bsc a very scientific technical degree 
in that particular domain or i could do choose to do a ba in computer science chemistry and so on right the curriculum is different the career opportunities are different but the fact that this has been recognized now as a full fledged thing that's what's important and this is what is going to play a very key role right these i'm not saying these are easier but they're relatively easier to get into a ba program that's what a liberal art a program is like right so yeah uh okay there were some okay lots of questions flooding in i'm sorry <laughs> we'll come to the questions quickly i think that's what we have i think one thing we want to say before we take your questions is just keep yourself updated reach out to us we'll be always happy to help i think that's what we can tell you it's very very important to look out for information or you have mind or you can reach out to the two of us as well so that's what we wanted to share now we'll take up a few questions before we close today uh okay i think i've done something here yes great um about a recognized diploma i mean okay very quickly we can answer questions about particular is in mascom yeah. is prevalent at i think go on Rahul. no there was one person who had asked is the value of internships going to be less uh forgetting where the question was basically they were talking about it from a german point of view they're looking at some sort of master specialization they are only looking for full time work experience and not internships and will that be relevant has any change is been done to that i would simply say it really when i think about germany and if i'm looking at internships and if even if i was an employer two things i would look at how long was that internship what were your key responsibilities where were you interning was it a full time internship if i was let us say that i'm a digital communication person let us avoid completely right and i was interning for let's say a mercedes typical german brand or a volkswagen a typical german brand the fact that i was interning with them for their digital media and there is no wonder you can go right now and check their accounts their social media presence is crazy right that's what will matter when it i have spent my 40 hour working week being an intern that's absolutely fine right the only thing is i'm learning while i'm working so that's absolutely matters so yes so when we talk about internships there are a lot of factors that matter you're not only doing that internship for the sake of it you're actually taking away some value so yeah um just again for people asking very specific career questions reach out to us we can answer those but we want to give you more insight towards the forecast best new phd in career guidance miss lalita please write to us we'll be more than happy to help you so please understand one thing phd is a domain that comes with your research in particular very broad domain the domain is education here so very broad question that way how to choose the right board if you plan to study abroad again since we're talking about forecast uh, ms shividya so uh, there's no right board as such some boards might make it easier for you yes but both abhishek and i have worked with students and they've come from all kinds of different boards there's no also we both have come we both come from icsc board and we both started abroad so any board i think works that's not a problem Miss Dimple, you're talking to the two of us. I think by now you should uh, have established. You should reach out to us. Yes, the uh, our emails are on front of your screen now, so that's the best way to reach out. Has the job market for US graduates shrunk? Will today's graduate crowd the market tomorrow? Okay, I don't understand the second part of the question, but uh, it has shrunk. Yes, US did see a recession, but I think US, US, US has also been one of the first few countries where the market and the economy is back on track very quickly. I mean, also, I want to yeah. Just to that, yeah. Raghav, I think we remember one thing: if President Biden asks for a meeting with all the CEOs in the U.S., you know, they're only going to be Indian snacks ordered because all the CEOs are Indian. Simple answer to that. Even though the also market can shrink, you have the answer. Absolutely. Look at any top uh, Silicon Valley company; there is an Indian at the top of it. So when Biden decides to talk to them, or even Justin Trudeau, for that matter, talking <laughs> exactly. to Canadian next, uh, the cabinet, you know the answer yourself. the social media presence so when i went about an internship uh, ms anusuya i was typically talking about it really matters where you do that internship what did you learn from it how long was it how many hours did you put in who were you working for all those things matter so mercedes was just an example because the question was germany specific and it is a very popular german brand so just that also ms sapna for psychology the entire world is literally you know as for anybody doing psychology it's been the most prevalent career domain in the last two three years only growing in important but for your reference to study uk us canada singapore netherlands some of the best schools in these countries australia for example it does matters where do you want to take it further so that's important 
Miss Annie, I'll be very honest here. Psychology and culinary arts very difficult to pursue together, but I can give you an example. Some somebody wants to be a chef, they can pursue culinary arts. Uh, they can pursue culinary arts as a regular degree at the best schools in the world and pursue psychology online. But you can reach out to us. <coughs> Uh, Ms. Sunanya, you this very difficult question because what I want to study is important and how to get your citizenship, Mr. Yashwant, very good question. Let me find an immigrant officer for you. You can reach out to me, I'll share the contact with you because they'll be able to answer better. And other in thing, fact, Ms. Sunanya. Share, in fact, share that information with us also. I'll, I'll, do, I'll, I'll do it with everybody. Uh, Ms. Sunanya, Sun, uh, Sunanya, Ms. Sunanya, I think the idea is understanding what I want to study, where I want to study, what my career prospects are and what I'm looking at doing down the line. That's very important to make the decision. So if I'm getting to Oxford, Harvard, you know what you'll be choosing. And But if you make it to University of Toronto in Canada, you have a whole different option to look at. It does depend on what we're looking at doing. Please reach out to us for any particular question that you've been asking. We'll be happy to help you uh, and respond to that. But I think it's been great. You've been a great audience like always. Always, always happy to go back to IEEE audience to speak to you. So thank you so much for that. Uh, do reach out to us. You've seen our email IDs, you know us. Uh, and thank you so much. Please, please, please do take care. That's very, very important. Just want to leave on that. So thank you so much, everyone. So yeah, thank you everybody for joining us. And as Abhishek said, uh, stay safe, take care, stay in, do your bit. Let's just fight it together and, you know, be victorious at the end of it. So yeah. Thank, thank you, you so everyone. much, everyone. Take care.